So, so that that's some good advice for for a first time home buyer. If you see a property, basically what I'm hearing you say is, if you see a property that you like, let's say it's 350 and it's been on the market for a month, four weeks, yeah, and it's still on the market, hasn't gone into contract, make an offer. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. Yeah, you know, make an offer. Well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on. This is my second episode of the Dream Big podcast. Congratulations. This is awesome, Pete. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, too. Yeah, for sure. This is my brother, Dan, and you've been in real estate now since 2009. About that. That's 2009. right. 2009. Yeah. <laughs> right now, you work over at Josh Barker's office. That's right. And you work with buyers and sellers. Primarily sellers. We Prim got it. We really focus on specialization. So and so, you specialize in helping the seller. That's right. I wanted to have you on to talk about your expertise as it relates to a first-time home buyer because a lot of buyers in this market they they might have a lot of questions on what a listing agent is, what a buyer's agent is, and how does it all come together for them. And so, my first question would be. You know, can you explain the difference between a buyer's agent and a listing? And what what is what is your role as a listing agent? How does it differ from helping a buyer? Yeah, good question. Um, well, first of all, I, one of the questions on here you had before we dive into that is, uh, you, I always like to share the story of how I got into real estate. Oh yeah, yeah, you, I you would love a, that. Yeah, you had a big big impact on that. You know, I, I yeah. probably wouldn't be sitting here today if my big brother Pete yeah. didn't. Uh, pave a pave a path for me so yeah definitely no but yeah back in 2009 I had graduated school and you know I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do and I had a hard time finding work if you remember back in 2009 there was yeah. a lot going on with the economy and real estate and yeah. you had been a lender for mm -hmm. a short while maybe five five six years or so yep and I remember calling mom and dad and talking to mom and dad about hey I you know I don't know what to do um, I'm working down here in LA looking for work. I've applied everywhere, can't seem yeah. to find a good job, and I've got wow. my business degree. And they said, You should call your brother Pete. He's uh, he's doing pretty well with loans. You should see if you could move home and get a job with Pete. And mm -hmm. so that's what I did. And that's you, awesome. You brought me into Megastar. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, at the time I, I was I was working for a company called Megastar, yeah. And I remember because you were gonna come work for me as doing mortgages. I remember this. And and then all of a sudden interest rates went up yes. and it slowed down and all of a sudden all the refis had stopped. And I'm like, Oh Dan, I'm really sorry. I don't have the business to, to be able to hire you. And you're like, okay. So then we kind of did an audible and then you went and got your real estate license. That's right. And that's how you, how you started. And that was in 2009. That was 2000. in 2009. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, it has been about 14 years, 14. Yeah. 14 years going on 15. Yeah. Wow. Well, you've come a long way. You have an amazing so thank story. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for... And maybe we'll talk about a little bit about your story. We're going to have you share a little bit, you know, towards towards the end of this, of, of your story of how you became a real estate investor, bought your first home, and, and all of that. But yeah, go ahead and share share with us what you do and, and, and what a listing agent actually is. Yeah, yeah. So... We, we truly believe in specialization. So what we found is the, the more specialized we can get in what we do, uh, the higher the level of service we can provide. I like it. So, um, you know, think of other industries, you know, step outside of the realm of real estate and think about like maybe a doctor. You know, eventually doctors become more and more specialized in, in their craft. So you've got a surgeon maybe who's really good with knee, brain, a brain surgery or, or brain or surgery. A, yep. A, someone that focuses just on the knee. Yeah. And focuses just on the foot. Exactly. And mm -hmm. the better they become, you know, the higher the level of service they can provide to their I, clients. I like okay. Um, you know, at the end of the day, what the other, the other reason we believe in specialization is it helps us to focus on what's best for the client. So the better we are at our craft, the, the better we can help our clients yeah. and put them first. I like it. So so what you're saying is you specialize in just helping mostly the seller. That's right. That's right. So okay. right now, early on in my journey, I, I did work with a lot of buyers. So 
I started out on the buyer side as a buyer's agent. Yeah. And I did that until about 2019. Okay. So about 10 years I worked with buyers. And then in 2019, I made that I see. shift to really trying to focus in on the seller side. Got it. So for our listeners, what Dan's talking about is you work with a seller. So if a buyer wants to go and buy a property, they have a, uh, a person that just represents the buyer, right? And then if they like the property that they want to buy or make an offer on, they're going to have to make an offer on that property. And that property is going to be, they call it a listing agent. And so you're actually representing the sellers. Most of the time you're representing sellers. And so you're looking at all the first time home buyer offers. That's right. That's right. And so when you have a listing and you're helping a seller, you're looking at all offers. So this is very important for a first time home buyer. It is. It is. I mean, at, we're we're um, we're seeking out inventory. So our goal is to find more inventory for the buyers to have for opportunity. Yeah. So without the inventory, the buyers wouldn't have options. Yeah, that's you know, true. So we're we're on a daily goal, daily, you know, hunt, search, yeah. if you will, for finding yeah. people that are ready to sell a home. Yeah. In the market we're in. Okay. Yeah. yeah, which right now we have an inventory crunch. We have lower inventory right now, and th that's ve very much needed, finding inventory that's and right. finding people to sell the homes. Inventory is historically down right now from what we've experienced yeah. uh, in the last year or two. Okay, and so I, I wrote down a couple questions here for, for you, for, for our listeners. So can you share some insights on how you determine the listing price of a property? Because a buyer, when they're going to make an offer, you know, a lot of them will see a home for sale and they're like, hey, I want to offer this. So how does how do you actually d determine the price for the home that's going to be listed for sale? How does that come about? Yeah, good question. So um, when when we approach sellers, we're we're trying to sell it for the absolute most amount possible. So That's you're, always the you're goal. looking, yeah, the goal is to help that seller get the most amount of yeah, money. You yeah. You know, every, every seller we meet has a goal in mind and, you know, we really want to understand that seller's goal mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, buy in with that goal with them. We yeah. want to really partner up with them on their goal and help them yeah. hit that goal, Yeah. which, you know, in every instance, you know, that's, getting the most amount possible so that they mm -hmm. can go and do what they want to do, whether it's buying another home, you know, moving out of state, um, maybe they want to downsize or upsize. So, yeah, you know, the price really matters. So our goal is to maximize that value as much as possible. Okay. And so when, how do you determine the value of that price? With, uh, with determining that value. Yeah. Sorry. You had to bring me back on that one. Yeah. Um, Basically, we, we start out by looking at what the market conditions are. So uh -huh. we want to understand the, the macro economics. We want to understand, okay, what's going on nationally? Um, and, then, and then from there, we're honing in on, okay, what's happening here locally in okay. the county? You know, nationally, we're talking about interest rates and inventory. Okay. You know, what's, yeah. what's going on there? with What's the Fed doing with bank rates? Mm -hmm. You know, what's any new policies out there that could affect value I nationally? See. Yeah. And then once we've established a good understanding of what's going on nationally, then we're taking a look at our local market here in the county. I see. So we'll dive into Shasta County numbers to get a feel for how many buyers are buying every month, how many new listings are hitting the market, yeah, um, how many um, you know transactions there are. Yeah. And that gives us an idea of, of that. And then the last thing we're looking at, once we have a good understanding of nationally, then Shasta County... And then at the very end, we're going to dive into the the neighborhood analysis. We want to have a good understanding of what's happening in their neighborhood. What homes have recently sold. Exactly. Okay. We do what we call a comparable market analysis, and we take a really close look at your active competition. Mm -hmm. You know, right now when you go to sell your home, if you've got four homes for sale in the neighborhood, we want to make sure we're competitive mm -hmm. at the highest price possible as well. Yep. So we're really critiquing how do we compare to the competition. Yeah. You know, okay. Um, and for the buyers out there, you know, what you could take uh, take on this is, you know, study study the homes you're looking at, and then it might not hurt to study the homes that have sold. Zillow is a pretty good feature with that, or different websites websites like Realtor.com. You can get a feel for. So, 
So what you're saying is at, for the the buyer, first time home buyer, they see a, a, a home that they love and they see the price. Let's say the price is currently listed by Dan for 350000 and they really like the home and they're like, okay, how do we, how do we know what to offer? Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what you're saying is they can go on Zillow. Is Now, is it the Zestimate on the Zillow that they're looking for? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I mean, Zillow is a, it's a tool, you know, for sure. Yeah. But it's not boots on the ground. So actually, I, sh- I shouldn't have said go go to Zillow. I should have said check out our website, readinghomes.com. Yeah, well, That'll actually, I mean, y- yeah, go ahead. Also, hire... You, you're you're likely working with a buyer's agent, so ask yeah. your agent to do that homework for you. I mean, that's yeah. what you're hiring them to do to get their expert opinion. Yeah, you know, if you're going to hire a buyer's agent, you want to make sure that that realtor has a good track record. The days of just, you know, calling mm-hmm. anybody and asking them to show you a home and making an offer. I mean. This is a whole nother topic, but I don't yeah. know how much. No, this is good. I mean, this is going to help buyers, you know, yeah. first time buyers. I mean, this is important. You can them. do that, you know, but I'd really recommend calling an expert, somebody who has a track record closing a lot of homes because a good agent won't even have to go look at comps. A good agent's going to say, hey, I've already shown these homes. I've already seen these homes and I, I've sold three on this in this neighborhood. I remember I remember when you were working with mostly buyers and th- you were actually working with mostly first time home buyers. Right. From 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15. I mean, that's all you were helping is first time home buyers. And I remember sending deals your way or talking to a customer, and you'd be like, oh, yeah, no, this, this house that sold this time, and this house sold over here in this neighborhood. I mean, you really understood. And the important piece to hit on this was, was when you were talking with that customer on buying this house. You would tell them, I think you could get it at this price, but you can offer what you want. Yeah. Like, this is the price that I think it's going to go for. And it might have had maybe three or four offers already on the table. And you're like, if you really want the house, this is kind of how much you're going to have to spend. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what you're talking about. You you want the first time home buyers, they need to have agents that know the market and understand the local market. That's right. That's yeah, right. That's huge. The, the better advice, you know, at the end of the day, when you hire an agent, you want the best advisor you can get. You know, you want someone with a ton of knowledge. Yeah. Because you're making a huge decision. Having that knowledge to make those decisions is, just puts you in the right position. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. or if you're going to hire an attorney to yeah. argue a case, do you want an attorney who's never done it before, but, yeah. you know, they went and t- took a test and passed yeah. the test and this is their first case? Yeah. Or do you want to hire somebody who's, you know, done tons of these cases, knows how to see around the corner for you and mm-hmm. gives you that advice ahead of time so that you're not falling into a trap? Yeah. You know? uh, so looking at the inventory, stu- you know, is your agent studying the inventory? So so let's let's say there's let's say I'm a first time home buyer and I want to pick the best, a really good buyer's agent that that knows the market, that understands these numbers, like you're saying. How would they go about finding an agent like that? That's a good question. I mean, track record is pretty easy to find. Mm-hmm. You know, you can look at it online, try to track down, the, you know. The, the ones that are doing lots of business, yeah. c- closing lots of deals. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And, of course, you can always ask for references from friends and family. Yeah. And then and then I would back it up with what's their track record. Yeah, I think, I think that's the the best one, right, referrals. I think that's that's huge. Friends, family someone that's already had a really good experience with that particular realtor. Yeah. 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 I like it. Okay. Let's say, let's say Dan, that you have a listing, right? And this one, like the previous example is listed for 350,000. Okay. You put it on the market and a couple days later you have four or five offers. What is important to you to sell the house? In other words, Let's say two of the or three of those offers are first time home buyers. Are you what are you looking for? Because obviously it's price, right? So let's just assume that they're all the same. Let's just assume that everyone's offering the same price. And we can get into the differences because this is multiple questions. But yeah, like yeah, I, but like I hear you. but like I know that you've probably have accepted <clears throat> lower offers for your customers. There was a lower offer that wasn't as high 
but you picked it because of other reasons. Sure. Yeah. And so I want you to, if you can just touch on some of that, those important aspects as a listing agent, picking a good offer. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever we get an offer, you have to understand it's not me, you know, I'm not paying that mortgage. Sure. So think of me as the seller's advisor. So my yeah. job is to explain all the options to the seller. Mm -hmm. You know, lay, I try to lay it all out for the seller just very simply. You know, I'll go over the major bullet points on each offer, starting with price, of course. And if yeah. all, all prices are the same, you know, the next thing we're looking at is some of the other terms, like when does it close? You know, closing is very important to a seller. Closing. Uh, close of escrow their timeline does this line up with them you know if i have a seller that's moving to you know indiana and they got to drive for three straight days and they're hiring a big moving truck and they got to pack and, and it has to be they have to be leaving on that day yeah and, and so they have to plan a trip like that mm -hmm. weeks in advance mm -hmm. so who's going to close on that date and who's going to honor the contract as best as possible yeah so we're we're sifting through those offers for the seller to do the homework that we need to do so that the seller can make the best decision for that move. And our job is to keep it as smooth of a process as possible. And in, in some cases, you know, if the offer we're looking for isn't there to make it smooth, mm -hmm. now we're explaining to the seller how we could make it as smooth as possible. Smoother. Smoother. For, for the seller. Yeah. yeah. For example, you know, if all the offers were 30-day escrow, uh, I might explain to the seller that, hey, you know, we know you're going to need to plan this trip. So what we might want to do is uh, request or counter back with a one or two weeks stay back in the house. Mm. So that way, if if worst case happens, it's day 29 of the escrow and we're supposed to close tomorrow and yeah. something happens with the transaction. Yeah. Um, the seller isn't packed up ready to leave tomorrow because he's got the two weeks stay back. I see. So we'll want to negotiate that into the transaction. Um, that's just one example of several things. Another thing we're looking into is their financing. You know, this yeah, this is financing. your this is yeah. your realm. W when we're looking at four offers and all of the offers have financing, we're taking a really close look at the pre-approval letter. Who is it? Are they local? What kind of appraisal network does that lender have? Do they have a good appraisal network, or do they have no appraisal network at all? If it's a Southern California lender or a lender from another state like Rocket Mortgage, we've been running into issues with the appraisal because they're ordering an appraisal and we're finding that appraisers don't want to pick that up because they the appraisers, when we ask the appraisers, they say, well, I'm not, I'm not getting fed a lot of business from Rocket Mortgage, so I'm going to focus on the clients that I have in front of me that I know are going to give me repeat business. Yeah. So then that rocket mortgage lender is having trouble getting an appraisal on time to meet the seller's timeline to close on time so that they can make that move. So that is, you know, time is probably the second most important so, thing to a seller. So on a scale of one to 10, how important is it uh, with the buyer, let's say, you know, first time home buyers picking a lender? How important is that on the offer as a listing agent? I just said it. It's the second yeah. most important thing second to price. Most, yeah. You know, yeah. so if, on your offer, you really want to make sure your your lender is going to perform to that contract. Yeah, it makes sense because what you're saying is that the appraisers, the local lenders, they 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 do a lot of business, and the appraiser, the local appraisers, they know each of us and will work hard for us. In other words, hit the dates. Now we obviously don't talk to them. We can't. We can't pick who the appraiser is, and we there it's random. So all of the compliance situations it makes sense to where you know we're not, but we're not actually contacting them. But these appraisers, they do have relation. We do have relationships with them. We do ask them to move forward and quickly get an appraisal done. Whereas what you're saying is Rocket Mortgage and some of these online lenders, they don't have that relationship built up with the appraiser. They don't know who this appraiser is. And so this appraiser may not be able to accommodate because they're accommodating the other local lenders that they have the relationships with who's giving them the, the business. Repeat business. Repeat yeah, there, business. There's something Makes to be sense. said about that. Yeah. You know, there's something to be said about having a good reputation and, and also having a reputation to protect. 
You know, yeah. Reading's a small community. Yeah. And, you know, these out of area lenders, they have nothing to lose. So if they drop the ball heavy, yeah. They're you know, no one's gonna track down that lender and go mm -hmm. and complain in their office or, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's no repercussion. Yeah. So, you know, it helps us on the seller side to know that it's a local lender. You know, I can call that lender up and I've worked with that lender in the past on other transactions and I can really get to the bottom of what's going on yeah. and and provide a smoother process for the seller, you know. Yeah. It really helps us to have a have more control over making it a smoother process. I love that. Yeah. I love that. As a listing agent, what what do you think are some common misconceptions with buyers with the with the buyer's agent and listing agent relationship as it relates to, you know, the listing agent helping the seller, the buyer's agent helping the buyer. What do you think what what would you say are some common misconceptions with first time home buyers and understanding that whole process. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to give me a more specific misconceptions, you know, like maybe, what? you know, as a first time home buyer, they may not know who gets paid or how, how does, how does a, in other words, do they have to pay for a buyer's agent? And I know there's some, yeah, a lot this of, is a big deal right this now. This is a big deal right now. <laughs> so I'm glad we're talking about it. But yeah. as a first-time home buyer, this is good good information for them to understand. Yeah. So how does the realtors get paid, and who pays the realtors? Yeah, good question. So it, it, it the process starts with you know we want to find find a seller and align ourselves with that seller to help them hit their goal. Mm -hmm. And when we uh, when we interview with a seller mm -hmm. to get their home sold. Um, we're, we're providing, we're laying out all the services that we provide to get their home sold for top dollar in mm -hmm. the time that they're looking for mm -hmm. and make it smooth along the way. Yeah. And when we're sharing that process, uh, we do negotiate a commission, a fee to, to sell the home. And that fee is established uh, with that seller. And then whatever that fee may be, commissions are negotiable. Mm -hmm. Whatever that fee is negotiated to, we take that fee and we typically cut it in half. Half of it goes to the listing uh, company, mm -hmm. and then the other half is offered out to all the other realtors in the county or in the state of California yeah, uh, or anyone who can sell a home in California. If they have a client or a buyer and bring that buyer to the table, uh, then we're offering out that other half of the commission to go to that realtor or and that company. And this is the way it's been for over a hundred years. Yeah, it's been that way a long time. I don't very, know if it's very, quite a very long, but time. It's yeah, long time. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing some research on this. It's it's been around for over a hundred years of how the commission structure has has worked. So, what you're saying, Dan, is that the listing the the seller of the property they're gonna they're gonna negotiate with the listing agent a certain amount of commission that would go to the listing agent, and the listing agent will then split that commission with the buyer that's who, the, buyer or sorry, the buyer agent who yeah. brings the buyer so technically speaking the buyer that's making an offer on the property they're not technically paying a commission it's coming from the seller side that's right and you know using the right language on that is important so yeah the uh the seller is paying that commission on mm -hmm. the closing statement and the seller negotiated that commission yeah and the buyer ultimately is paying the purchase price they they do so pay it essentially in the, in the price. you yeah. know the essentially the buyer is paying the full price of the home mm -hmm. and th that buyer you know is represented by a real estate agent and so that yeah. agent's getting paid for uh helping yeah. the buyer buy that property yeah and for our listeners the, it's a topic right now because Right now, NAR, National Association for Realtors, is being litigated against for a practice basically saying that the seller is not allowed to pay the buyer's agent's commission. Right. And there's go they're going back and forth, and it could change. This rule could change, and it could, it could be very different than what it is today. And I don't know what that's going to be, and maybe you don't either, but... It's a good it's a good topic to to understand how it works currently. Yeah, I I I did a little bit of reading up on it and and basically with the, what what I gather from it, Pete is the the lawsuit was about buyers uh, not having an opportunity to know or understand that a commission was being paid that they didn't get to negotiate. 
the buyers. The buyers. Wow. The that buyers. Makes sense. They yeah. don't. They haven't. They yeah. don't get to. Yeah, they. It didn't. is is what it is. Mm-hmm. That makes complete sense. Yeah. So so you know that is what it is. It it's you like you said it's been this way for a really long time. Yeah. Um, your question about you so, know so how yeah, it works the, with commissions. Yeah, and common misconception is a buyers buyers don't understand who who pays who and how the money's. Yeah, essentially, worked. when a buyer buys a property, they're paying the the full price for that property. And a commission is paid to their realtor through the seller. Yeah. Um, but the buyer did pay that full purchase price to cover that commission. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, you know, I always, I always, when I was working with a lot of buyers for ten years, I always uh, would explain that to the buyers when I was mm-hmm. f- sitting down with them, and especially first time home buyers, and explaining yeah. the process. I would let them know that, um, you know, you're going to buy this home, and when you do, you're going to pay the full price. And you don't have to pay me directly. The on the closing statement, the seller is going to have a commission offered to me for helping you buy that to, home. To the listing agent, the listing agent then gives yeah, you the commission. Yeah, it goes yeah. from the seller to, to the, the listing, listing agent, agent, and the listing, listing agent, agent to, offers to, to the buyer's to agent. The buyer's agent. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so makes sense. Okay, cool. Well, I appreciate you going over that. It's it's super important to to understand for for a first time home buyer. Here's here's uh, another question for you. We touched on negotiating negotiations with your with your expertise. Let's say you know you spent ten years working with first time home buyers and have and and you have your experience now working with sellers. Let's say you go back to being a buyer's agent and you have a first time home buyer in this market. What advice would you have to that buyer? Man, what an opportunity being, being you have right now. You know. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah, I do too. I do um, too. You know, dream big. I think, you know, that comes with if, if you want to attain for home ownership, if you look at the last hundred years in appreciation of real estate, it's typically a win decision, you yeah. know, over the long run. Yeah. Um, 80, at the last 84 years since they've been tracking it, since 1941, yeah. Case Schiller. There's only been seven years where real estate has actually declined. Right. That's right. that's a statistic. And we're we're somewhat in a dip right now. You know, values are not appreciating twenty percent anymore. So this is it's in my slowed mind, down. Yeah, it's, it's slowed, slowed down. it's slowed down. The number of transactions over the last two years has been almost cut in half. Mm. So we have less trans less mm-hmm. buyers buying. Now does that mean that real estate is going down? I mean, I obviously know the question, the answer, but yeah. I want you to explain. Value has come down okay. as for the whole county. I want to say from the peak, I think you'll have to check me on this, but I think the peak of the market was in June of last year. So I do know the statistic on this. Okay. So so the peak was in June of last year. I don't know the local numbers, so you may more know. I'm, I'm speaking to Shasta County. Okay, so, so Shasta County. I do know national numbers. National numbers... We we hit a peak in January of last sorry of June of last year, twenty twenty two. We actually overtook that peak. We have a new peak this year. We've nationally we've hit all time highs for like three or four months up until September. Yeah. And there's five different companies that track this Case Schiller, FHFA, Black Knight, Zillow, and there there's another one, but they all are showing record highs for real estate, which is I know you're saying there's an opportunity for buyers, and what I'm what I'm hearing you say is that there's opportunity because they have the opportunity to find homes and allow for negotiating maybe the price. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, I've been doing this for you know a while, and when I was working yeah. with a lot of buyers during 2020 and 2021, uh, if you had a buyer, if you're a realtor working with a buyer at that time. Could you imagine making an offer on a home that has 10 offers and you're mm. you're trying to win? How many years, how many, sorry to cut you off, how many years did you go with with a market like that? I've been doing this since 2009 and I've only seen that in 2020 and 2021. Okay. Yeah. And so in parts tw- of 2022. 2012 to like 2018, how many uh, typical offers were? Depended on the uh, deal, you know, but on the average... Um, that's a good question. I don't want to shoot from the hip, but it, it, it certainly wasn't like 2020 through 2023 yeah. okay. where, you know, every house has multiple offers and yeah. you'd have to go well over the list price to get it. Yeah. 
typically speaking, you know, if a home if a home was just listed, this is where expertise comes in. If a home was just listed, I could tell you if it was a good deal or not based on what's been selling yeah, in the neighborhood. I like that, yeah. So, so you know, it's really hard to put a blanket statement on how I see how the years have been, but yeah, as a whole, you know, the last three years, properties, you know, any any home could sell. I mean, we all saw the memes of you yeah. know shacks being listed and. <laughs> getting yeah, 20 plus that. offers and you have yeah. to give your firstborn too. So you're <laughs> saying so you're saying the opportunity for first time home buyers they're not experiencing that now. That's right. Yeah, so so those days are gone and now we're experiencing a process where buyers can look for those opportunities. It surprises me, Pete, because I have some inventory to where it's maybe been on for you know, uh, 3 weeks mm -hmm. and there's no offers, not one offer. Wow. And what the reason that surprises me is that home will sell for the right price. Right. Yeah. And and for whatever reason, buyers or maybe their agent aren't advising them to make a lower offer on that home. And so if if you know if we're on the market for three or four weeks, I hear what you're saying. So you're what you're saying is okay, Pete. I had this property. It's been on for three weeks. Normally, what would happen? Let's say in two thousand eight, nine, ten, you get an offer for ten thousand less, twenty thousand dollars less, but yeah. you're not getting any offers. Twenty fifteen, twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen, buyers were they still were making offers. They would just make coming an offer if under, they liked coming the home. under. Yeah, that's right. So, so that that's some good advice for for a first time home buyer. If you see a property, basically what I'm hearing you say is, if you see a property that you like, let's say it's three hundred and fifty, and it's been on the market for a month four weeks yeah and it's still in the market hasn't gone into contract make an offer doesn't hurt doesn't hurt yeah you know make an offer okay great yeah um what what other advice would you would you have you know uh look for those deals that have been on for quite some time mm -hmm. you know if they've been on for two months three months yeah you know what i was trying to say earlier was i'd rather be a buyer in today's market than i would you know, a year and a half, two years ago. Now take that with with some reasoning behind it. I'd rather be a cash buyer in that market and in this market, I'd rather be a cash buyer today. Today? Yes. Okay, what if you don't have cash? You can find good deals. Yeah, you know, I like it. You can find good deals. I, I believe that if you can afford the home, if, if you're a first time home buyer and you can afford the home and you can afford that payment, and it's not going to overstretch you. 100% get in the market right as soon as you can. Agree with that. As soon as you can get in the market. The reason why I say that, Dan, is because we have 610, 620 homes on the market right now mm -hmm. in Shasta County. In 2012 to 2019, how many homes on average were on the market during that time? Oh, probably 800 to 1,000. Yeah, it's more like 1,200 uh, okay. uh, on average in the summer months. Sorry, in the summer months. Yeah. Summer, you know, it might, inventory always always comes down in, in, in the summer, um, and then it goes up in the winter. But when I was doing my research, it was, you know, 1,000 to 1,200. I haven't checked it recently okay. over the last 10 years. So. Okay. Yeah. So, so we have 600 homes on the market. And during the 2012 and 2019 homes, on average in Shasta County, appreciated about 6% per year. It's, you know, it was 5%, 8%, 5%, 8% during those years. And we had that much inventory. And so we have a really, really bad affordability problem right now. Not nearly as many people can qualify for a home. That's why I say if you can qualify, get into a home. Right. 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 And if you can qualify, definitely go into it. And so I do believe that rates will come back down eventually. I don't know when, I'm not going to predict when, but when they do come down, because we don't have the inventory that that we should, there's going to be a lot more people that can afford a home and a mortgage payment than what there are homes to be able to sell. Right. Yeah. And then prices will go back up again. Like what you were saying at the beginning of the podcast is you're looking for inventory, right? Right. So, so your goal is to find homes and find inventory. And what I what I talk about with my customers and, and the people that I talk to is in order for a real estate crash, we need inventory. Surplus. We need a surplus. We need 
a lot more homes for sale to have a crash. And my big question is, where are those homes going to come from? Right. It's not going to be new construction. We're tracking that. Why is that? You want to talk about that? Buyer demand slowed down. So with the slowdown of buyer demand, uh, new construction can't. They're having a hard time. Yeah, they can't go at the pace that they were. Uh, So they had to make some adjustments to the amount of buyers, like you said, that can qualify to buy right now. New construction. But where did the inventory come in 2007 when we had the real estate crash? Oh, yeah, you know this too. So we had a SERP. I mean, I call them napkin loans. Yeah. You know, I I didn't coin that term. Napkin loans, yeah. Yeah, here, (laughs) write write down on this piece piece of paper how much you make, and we'll give you a loan, right? Yeah. Um, And and tell us what you do. And Yeah. the big short, you know, great yeah. movie on it. But yeah. uh, buyers were basically leveraging 100% financing, yeah. which has know, not arm been loans. The case. Yeah, we're not seeing that at all right now. The yeah. the loan products have been, you know, I, what do you call them? A plus or oh, they're all A paper loans. A paper loans. Yeah, a, yeah. yeah we're d- fully documenting the so pay stubs. A B C and D or how yeah, far I mean, does it go? back then there was you know A paper, B paper. B paper was hey, they had assets, but they we didn't show their income right and and so then there was c paper c paper where we didn't show their assets or their income okay and all they did is say i make this much <laughs> and i have this much in the bank and they put it on the application and signed their name so they said they had that much but obviously they were liar loans <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so so the inventory in 2007 to get back on track the, the inventory came from sellers right from people that own homes right so right yeah sorry to go on the tangent that's but right the you know once everyone realized they needed to sell their properties or they couldn't make everything float when when they had a surplus of supply and they couldn't put a renter in the house they realized oh we might have to sell this property we're paying we're paying the mortgage on five homes we own yeah and we can't get tenants in these homes so So we got to sell them and then you have so do you think that's so so obviously it's different now with the mortgages but this is this is my big question so i have a first-time home buyer webinar that I do once a month and my listeners I'll put the link below but I do a webinar every every month yeah and I talk super I highly recommend it it's a really good webinar I've watched a few of them and nice. you know, you're giving really good information thank you yeah, yeah. so I talk about this on not just because you're my brother <laughs> <laughs> so I, I talk about this on 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 the webinar is supply and demand so the, the, if someone's selling their house back then they were they were selling and going to rent but if someone sells their house, what's the likelihood of them renting another house? I'm not seeing that a whole lot. In fact, sellers are, they don't want to get priced out. They'd like to get Can into keep, another home. Sta- yeah. Yeah, keep they don't want to pay. Yeah. I mean, rent is, it's, there's nothing wrong with renting. I mean, it serves very For good sure. purpose, you know. But when, you, when you're renting, you're truly paying 100% interest. Yes, rates right now are high, but renting is 100% interest. Right. If we did have a crash and we need the inventory for a crash, where the inventory came from last time in 2007 was sellers. But now today, if someone sells, they're not selling and renting, they're going to sell and buy. So does that create or does that take away from inventory? It's It's a cancellation. It's a cancellation. It's neutral. Yeah, because they're selling and then they're buying. Yep. So they're not really adding inventory. And we need the inventory for a crash. So we where's where is the inventory gonna come to from? To answer your question, it's it's not gonna come from anywhere, Pete. <laughs> I mean, we'd need builders building a lot of homes, we need, we a do. surplus. And, and uh, yeah. So to come back to the original question, advice that you have for a sell, for, for a first time home buyer is, is is take the opportunity. That's if right. If you can. Yeah. I I I think you can find a good opportunity. I'm all, I'm always a buyer. There's always a deal nice. to be had. That's you know, good. that's the mentality yeah. everyone should have, you know. Yeah. Which leads me to I, I I wanted to touch a little bit about your story and about how we talked about how you got in the real estate business. And when you when you became a realtor, did you buy but did were you a homeowner when you got in the real estate market mm-hmm. as a realtor? No. No. <laughs> so uh, I know there's your story. I was going to see if you could just share your story of how you bought your first house, because I think it's very inter- an interesting story that uh, yeah. here. Yeah. You know, it, it, it kind of stems on everything that you were just sharing. Try to try to figure out how you can qualify. 
So if you can get to that point for, first, I, you know, thinking on the early stage, you have to make that decision. You have to want to, you have to want to be able to own a home Yeah. Uh, for one reason or another. Yeah. Um, so figure out how to, how to want a home. You know, yeah. I can't ma- answer that question for everybody, yeah. but I knew I wanted to be a homeowner. Once I established that, I was thinking about, okay, how am I going to purchase a home? So, so I just started saving. I said, okay, well, this is my monthly expenses. So this is how much I have to spend to live. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about, okay, if, if this is what my monthly expenses are, how much more extra can I put away in the bank and save Mm. on top of that? Um, and then I set a goal of, okay, I'm just going to save what I can and put away what I can. And then I'll wait for an opportunity essentially. I think that's huge. I I think that's, uh, that's huge because a lot of first time home buyers, my story is a little bit different. Like I didn't save, like I saved a little bit, but I, I didn't like set a goal in mind and then, and then hit that goal. What happened for me was an emotional deal. Like I saw the house and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to have that house. It was cheap at the time back in, this is back in 2001. And it was a brand new home for 130. I remember that in Anderson, yeah. Yeah. the new construction. Yeah. Ravenwood. Yeah, and so I saw this house and I, 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 I wanted it. So I made this decision to, emo- it might, for me it was emotional. Yours was more logical, more methodical, which, which b- is great. I mean, I think that's how it should be. Like I should have sa- been saving, you know. So, so I think that's great advice for a first-time home buyer. Set a goal, start saving. Yeah, and not all of my purchases were that way too, you know. When the right opportunity presents itself, are you prepared? I think that's the takeaway. Yeah. But it, it does start with a dream, you know. It's in yeah. line with, you know, what do we want to accomplish? Yeah. Um, but at, at, you're right. At the end of the day, I would say a majority of the properties I have purchased were more of an opportunity just was there. Yeah. I didn't. I don't know when it's going to hit, and then all of a sudden the deal is there, and it's like, whoa. And then the first thing I do is I check to see if I have, do I have the resources for that Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when the deal's there? Yeah. And I, I can tell you nine times I don't, <laughs> Yeah. but uh, one time out of 10, I do. You know, I've been watching this and staying up to date on this is credit card debt. Car payments now, the average car payment is about $900 a month, eight, $900 a month. If you want to go buy a new car, Dan, you, it's 900 a month-ish. For a new car, credit card debt it just reached over a trillion dollars. So it's huge. So I think this is very important advice, and I appreciate you telling that because if you're a first-time home buyer and if you're wanting to purchase a new home, that credit card debt it takes work, you know. And we can definitely help you if you do have credit card debt. Like we we help our customers teaching them how to get get it, how get how to get rid of it how to maximize their credit score how to really change that course yeah this is Pete this is where I really love what you do because I remember for the last however many years you know I would I'd run into people and everyone has a different situation but a lot of times it's hard for people to know what know how to map out a plan yeah and I just I can't even remember how many people I'd say it's it'd be a good place for you to start to learn where you're at and then mm-hmm. let's create a plan for you you know go talk to so and so Peter or you know others yeah this is where I really appreciate what you do because you you really Thank can you. help people you know understand where they are and help them make a plan and it would come come back round all the time you know mm-hmm. i'd send someone to you and then six months later you'd say okay dan they're ready to go they just yeah. left the office yeah they hit their they hit the Target. plan yeah they got yeah. across the finish yeah. line now it's time to find a house they get to go yeah. shopping yep how cool that's, is that that's one of my when dan i can tell you when that happens i mean I, I get so much joy from meeting with a family going over their whole history of life of you know, income and, and, and credit and everything and really helping them and sitting down and helping them. And the ones that, that, that actually do take the time to, to, to listen and, and, and to do the things they come back. I, 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 it brings so much joy to me. 
It's awesome. You know, it's it's, it's life changing. Yeah, you're changing their changing their their course. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, keep up the good work. Uh, thanks, Dan. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Dan. Um, any anything else? Any last thoughts on advice for first time home buyers? Yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, find those good deals. Always be yeah. a buyer. You know, even if mm-hmm. it's your first time. Yeah. Map out a plan. Just create like a it. plan. Talk to Pete. Nice. He'll, he'll help you map that plan out to a T. Yeah. He'll tell you exactly where you are and exactly where you need to go. So if we do have potential sellers or or, or buyers, how how can how can someone get a hold of you if they wanted to get in touch with you? Yeah, they can call me um, on my cell phone or email me. Yep, they can Google me. They can find me. Okay, cool. Yep. Well, thank you, Dan. Appreciate yeah, thanks it. Thanks for having me on, Pete.